What's up, everybody? Michael Silva here. Hope you're all having a wonderful weekend. I'm kind of on a time crunch, so I got to try to make this video, it's action-packed, within a little bit of time. So let me take in a big deep breath. <sighs> Today, I want to be sharing my viewpoint on the markets, mapping out some key levels known as expected moves. Expected moves are a calculation. They're based on options, implied volatility. They're crucial to making informed decisions as an investor and or a trader. But that's not all. We're also going to be talking about zones, the zones indicator. And on top of that, we're going to be talking about many other indicators to prepare us for the trading week ahead. So sit back, grab a pen and paper, and let's get into it. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back. We're looking at the quarterly chart of the S&P 500. So as we all know, the Fed has been raising rates and we have an inverted yield curve. The market here is pricing in that the Fed may be reducing rates, which we discussed on prior videos. When we see the market go into a rapid rate reduction, we have seen times in the market where it's not all that good. On a positive note, though, we're back above that five-period EMA. Some people might look at this on the quarterly chart and be like, hey, it's actually flagging. It looks pretty good. Smooth sailing up ahead. If you take a look at the monthly chart on the S&P 500, we finished up 3.51% on the month, and we finished 7% up for the quarter on the S&P 500. So if you take a look at this, we are above that five-period moving average, and you can see the 20-period monthly moving average, it has been holding as a level of resistance, and price is not fully above that. Actually, if you were to zoom into this chart, what you'll notice for the last five months is we had a green candle close at the high, goes to red, green candle closes to the high, goes to red. Then we have a green candle that had a, actually a higher close than the prior one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven months, maybe eight. I have to, I have to look into that close. Uh, and we close right there at the high. So their bulls still have some work to do, as you can see, but you know, right here, the bulls are grabbing the grabbing the whole the, the investors are grabbing the bull by the horns right now. You can see here this is the total assets, the Fed balance sheet, and we saw this big rapid rise after all this time trying to decline the balance sheet. We saw a big hit, obviously adding liquidity into the system. Actually, Sven Henrik, the Northman trader, pointed this out. If you look at bank reserves, he pointed out the very strong correlation in bank reserves to the S&P 500. If you zoom into this, bank reserves right here actually hit a low earlier in the year, and then it started moving up. We saw a recent pop during the banking crisis, and guess what followed the S&P 500? So this could be one to track. He actually stated a uh, reference. The last time that the Fed balance sheet suddenly expanded and was called not QE was during the part of 2019. And the bank's reserves did this. And you can see they started going up. S&P 500 followed. That's what it looks like when liquidity is added back into the system. But that doesn't leave everybody warm and fuzzy. Here's a hedge fund manager or prior hedge fund manager, if I remember correctly. The reasons why I'm in 70% cash is that I have no clue what's going on currently. And I'm I'm not afraid to admit it. That's very rare to find on FinTwit is people that just say, I don't know what the heck's going on, so I'm just going to protect myself and be in cash. We're going to get into some expected moves now. If you're unfamiliar with what expected moves are, this is a key levels to watch on whatever time frame it may be. I We're going to go over daily. We're going to go over weekly. We're going to go over monthly. We're going to go over quarterly for the S&P 500. If you're part of the Discord community, you already know them for other products as well. But Think of it as a distribution curve. The levels that I'm going to be giving you 68% of the time, the market is going to close within these levels. And actually, what I know a lot of traders to do is they sell premium when it hitches the edges of those expected moves. And that's kind of an idea for traders and or investors. If you're looking in a, if, if you know, if the market's in bullish context and you want to wait for it to hit the lower edge of the expected moves, that's a possibility too. Or if you're, if it's in a bearish trend, you can potentially sell at the higher expected moves there too as well. 95% of the times it finishes in with an, a two sigma move. And then 100, almost 100% 100 of the time, it's very rare to get price on a three sigma, three standard deviation move, okay? So if we take a look at the S&P 500 on the monthly time frame, you're going to see some lines on my screen. The red shaded area, this is measuring minus 20% from the peak down. Okay. So this right here is known as what consensus, most consensus is bear market territory. When you get into minus 20%, I was told by an ex Goldman trader that, Hey, when we get outside back outside of the red zone or the 20%, that's when we enter into the back into the bull market. Now this, I've actually looked through history on these charts and it is actually a very key level to watch. I will note this. I don't have the chart. 
S&P 500 is out of bull market, or it's in bull market territory, technically, but the Qs are not, okay? NASDAQ 100 is not. And then also Russell 2000 is not as well. So we've seen through history where markets can get up outside of this. For remember the last month, one, two, three, four, so four out of the last five months, and we can go back further, has been touching that bear market territory. So if it starts breaking back down, it could be a bad thing. Now, the lines on the screen, the dashed lines, those are the quarterly expected moves. So it's saying, hey, the options market, it's looking forward, looking at potential catalysts. It's saying this quarter, we see price potentially going as high as just about 4,500 to as low as just below 3,800 for the quarter. So if you want to take a screenshot of this, these are the dashed lines right here. So 4456 and 3762. And then the solid line is the monthly expected move, the move that's based off of options implied volatility. Volatility. What did I just say? Volatility? Options implied volatility. Whatever. Oh, man, one of those days. All right. I gotta keep I gotta keep moving. But yes, we're back above that five-day moving average. PMO is starting to flatten out here. We saw some decent volume come into as well. We'll get more tactical on this lower time frame charts. Let's take a look at the weekly chart right now. You can see we're back above that 50 period weekly moving average the 200 is still sloping up honestly it looks pretty bullish right so this could be one heck of a bear trap i mean one way to look at this is if you look at this high this high and this high and you were to connect you know something right through those lines it's you know you can see it it hits here and it gets rejected pretty hard rejected pretty hard rejected pretty hard and then if you just take a line from maybe even this low actually Huh. Interesting. I just I just thought that I was thinking about these two lines right here. But actually, if you take it from this low and you just measure it up to these, you know, closes and opens over here on these three weekly candles, and then it comes right to here. So if we get a potential breakdown from this level, it could be pretty bearish situation. Now the weekly expected moves are down here. This is what I find very interesting. Okay. So this right here is the S&P 500, the last day of the quarter, last day of the month. It was a $58 move, give or take a little bit. The weekly expected move is $60. So something a little obviously strange is taking place, right? So we had one day where it moved 58, right? It was the end of month, end of quarter, but the whole week is pricing in saying, Hey, we're looking at $60 expected move, which seems little to me, albeit we don't trade on Friday in the S&P 500. Um, I also marked out some two Sigma levels for you. If you're part of the Discord, you got, you're got you getting 40 plus products or something like that of all of these key levels. So upper levels, lower levels are right here for the SPY in the S&P 500. But as it stands right now, yeah, we're kind of just going sideways. We saw a good week. It was up 3.48%. We don't really know if it's window dressing or end of month markup or whatever you want to call it, but it's... It was a pretty strong weekly close, letting me think that we can see some continued push up over there. Now, if I take a look at the daily chart of the S&P 500, the last time we were really talking about these anchored VWAPs, well, we were talking about them for the last couple of days, but we talked about this pinch, right? So this part right here anchored to here, and then you saw price action was coiling up, right? It expands, it contracts. We said, if it breaks out, you can get more bullish. And guess what? We talked about this volume shelf, how it kind of just is empty right here, like a window to this shelf. Well, it took three days to just kind of just squeeze up in here and right to our key level, right at about 410, closing at the high. So it'd be interesting to see like this type of move, I feel like can, you know, potentially get a little bit further out before it consolidates, but we just got to be on guard that the move has been very strong these last four days into the end of month. It's going to have to digest. So don't get too FOMO'd out. And we'll talk about that more on some various indicators. If we take a look at the SPY on the 15 minute time frame, the daily expected moves now, first and foremost, I just want to say the bulls are clearly in control here, but that doesn't necessarily mean you buy up here, okay? The bulls are in control, so you look for pullbacks to price to pull back at. As it stands right now, the week, the daily expected move going into uh, trading day on Monday, 4.1273 to the high end, 4.06.05 to the low end. And you can see we've just been on this gap and rip sort of kind of Tra trajectory here. So we'll continue to watch for pullbacks to potentially get bought and that continuation to move. As long as price stays above the five day moving average, we're looking pretty good as it stands. But like I said, you want to look for consolidation. You want to be patient. It can get a little crazy and it'll open up your eyes when you start to see these zones. So the zones, what are the zones? So the zones are, is an, it's, it's, it's a tool that I use to really gauge from a large view, from a big macro view of many different markets, what is overbought and what is oversold. And it allows me to get a good idea from an intermarket standpoint and just a really quick glance into the markets. Now, this indicator is originally from the book, 
the misbehavior of markets. It's a fractal indicator using uh, partially what's called bridge ranges from Benoit Mandelbrot. Now, Joe Cat, he he created this indicator and he integrated uh, Bollinger Bands, bridge bands, and then also the Hurst exponent. Exponent. Okay. And you, you basically plopped out an indicator that allows you to see this. Now, all I did was I had it coded for the software that I use uh, and I transferred into that software and was able to extract large data sets. And the reason why I do that is because it allows me to see stuff from an Excel standpoint and not get so caught up on the technical chart, but it allows me to see, hey, what are the numbers right out of the gate? Okay, what's the low end of this, this zone? Okay, what's the low end of the zone? What's the high end of the zone? And what is um, the upside to the, you know, percent upside to the product and to the downside. So instead of looking at one single product, I can pull up SPX, volatility, 10 year yield, the dollar. And then I can look all the way down here at many, many different products and sector ETFs. And the range, the range is allowing us to see very quick bird's eye view is, hey, is it at the high end or is it at the low end? So when the range is starting to get light red to red, it's telling me, hey, things are getting pretty heated up from a fractal, fractal, fractal standpoint. Oh man, I'm tripping on my words today. So price is getting a little extended. This is a good kind of glimpse of as far as turning points. So this is what the zone sheet look like at different points of the market. Notice here, when it gets down here, a lot of bearish talk down into this range. And then I start talking about the, the signals turning green. Okay. And then it moves all the way up here. And then all of a sudden we're just lighting up bright red. All right. And then all of a sudden every bull is like, no way. And then the market comes down, same thing right here. And then what are we at right now? We're starting to see bright red again. Does that mean the market's going to turn down like it did here? That's not necessarily what it means. What it means is it means things are getting extended. It could just consolidate into the middle of the range. And then all of a sudden the zone sheet here will start turning white. Uh, and by white, I mean, it's going to go more towards the middle of the range. So price action, if you look at the mid range, okay, this is the Hearst exponent. Uh, you can use this as a potentially a short term trend in the market. And if price is above this, that's actually a positive sign. When it starts closing below it, from what I've seen, you got to be a little bit more hesitant. Now, I, I personally on the Discord, I update these daily. They're dynamic, they're constantly changing, but to keep it easy, I just update it in one document. And what it looks like is this I give all the SP 100 stocks all of the S&P 100 stocks. It's crazy. And basically it'll show you, you know, the color of the range, the closing price, the percent upside to the high end, the percent downside to the low end. That doesn't mean it's going to drop there, but it's going to rotate in and out of the high end to the low end. It does that all the time. All right. So I do the S&P 100. It's starting to light up red. Global ETFs. The other day, this whole sheet was red. So it's kind of coming off a little bit right now, but still very extended here. Okay. And if we look at commodities, because some commodities are heating up here, you can take screenshots of this if you want to look at the ETFs that I'm tracking. Uh, if you take a look at currencies, there's only one right here that's getting a little uh, heated up red. Take a look at fixed income assets. Okay. So fixed income as another a bunch of different products I tracked there. And then volatility as well. Volatility notice is coming to the green section, which means it's hitting the lower end while many of these different products throughout global markets, throughout different asset classes, they're starting to turn very red. And then I also do, uh, I throw China in there too, some China equities because China has been some really good trading there. Now, this isn't like, this is just the start of it. And a lot of people ask me, Hey, so how do I trade this? Do I just buy here at the low? This is, this is up to user discretion. Like I said, I use this to quickly identify what might be overbought and oversold and guide my direction there. And then I go into using rather, you know, other technical analysis. Now, some people might look at this and be like, Okay, so here's the range. I have a high, a low, a midpoint. I um, I'm bullish, you know. But you gotta you gotta understand. Okay, what is bullish? What is bearish? Right? Because even if it comes to the high end or the low end, is the product say TME? Is it a bullish trend or is it a bearish trend? Okay, that's where it comes into trends. So you need to understand this. Uh, if you are using these type of products, you need to know what your short-term trend is, your medium-term trend is, and your long-term trend. And that's whether you use moving averages, Don Chain channels, MACD, PSARs, and et cetera. There's a bunch of different indicators. Here's one that I kind of put together here. This is Don Chain channel. And I just applied, uh, this is also part of part of what, what he added in there, but I just made some subtle changes to allow me to see, hey, is short-term bullish, it'll go green, medium-term's neutral. And I usually put this on my chart. It's something that I 
use on occasion. That's that's one example. But you can also use something like moving averages, right? EMA 5, 10, 20, or more specifically, 20 period, 50 period, 200, right? If it's above the 20, it's short-term bullish. If it's below it, it's short-term bearish. And you can get a good idea as to saying, hey, if the price comes to the low end of the range, should I be buying it if it's short if I'm a short-term bull? Or is should I be buying it or adding to positions if I'm a long-term bull? Okay, so that's just a quick rundown there on the zones and where we kind of stand. Like I said, as where we stand, things are heating up pretty red. If we take a look at some indicators, some bullish things are happening, but also some things to say, hey, pump your brakes, chill out right now. Some of the bullish things that are taking place, the NASDAQ summation index, we clicked over. So this is identifying a potential change in trend. As you can see here, we trend, changed trend right there and the market started moving down. Now the market's already been moving pretty strong to the upside and we just got this clicked over. So understand that it's still bullish as long as the parabolic star stays under. So even if we pull down a little bit and this still continues to move up, that can still be a great potential opportunity that allows for a good risk to reward trade. The Nisey McClellan summation index, this is the New York Stock Exchange, has now been two days of a potential trend change, and you can see it's moving. But if you look at the, Na the Nasdaq McClellan oscillator over here, this is the traditional calculation. It's getting a reading of about 250. And when you get up into this range, it can mark potential turning points or pauses and consolidation. So be aware of that. It's nice to see this breath, breath thrust and this turnover, but also just prior to this, we saw a cross below zero and a breath thrust to the downside. So really we're just chopping here, getting a lot of whipsaws. So we need to remain cautious. One other thing is growth to value. The rate of change now just went negative. I'm using a 10 period rate of change, measuring IWF to IWD, growth first value. And you can see here, this is a chart of the Qs. And when we cross down through zero, you know, sometimes it might fix it right away. But when we cross down through zero, it has actually been a warning sign that the Qs go through somewhat of a pullback or a period of digestion in the very near future. Another thing to call out is looking at something like tips over treasury bonds and you map out a rate of change when it gets up to a higher rate of change around 1.3, 1.2. As we can see, the red lines, volatility actually spikes not too far after. You can see here we've seen spikes. It's pretty darn, pretty darn accurate. You never know how far it can spike. And then when it gets to a minus 2% rate of change, we've seen actually reductions in volatility. It subsides. You never know how much it's going to subside. But this spike right here, this rapid rate of change between tips and treasury bonds might be telling us, hey, you know, we might be seeing a little bit of a move in volatility here soon. Another thing that you can look at is something like v VXV over VIX. This is back month volatility versus front month volatility. And one thing that I've noticed here, um, another trader called this out too as well. Uh, I believe his name is Brandon Chapman. You can see here that when we see a rise between the back month versus front month volatility to around that 100 or one, we'll just call it, so what I say, 1.2% or sorry, 1.2 level, which is about 20% difference. You can see that the mar it's actually marked some market top. So you can see, boom, right here, VIX, the VIX is brown shaded. Boom, it marked this top. Boom, right here, VIX was down. Boom, that marked that top. But the last couple of turning points, say right here, or say around this area right here too, you can see that actually the back month versus front month is where we currently are now. So volatility is coming to this area and we're starting to see this rise. So if this were to squeeze up a little bit more, I'd be even more cautious as it stands here, just looking at that structure. If we take a look here at NASDAQ composite bullish percent index, you can see it's working itself off of these overextended areas. Remember, things got beaten up, they got slammed, and now we're seeing the market move forward. Just like the zones, this bullish percent index, the RSI, it rotates between oversold, or sorry, overbought and oversold, oversold and overbought and oversold and overbought and so forth. So we're moving back up potentially into that overbought condition. Now, what I find interesting here is when you think about it, like, well, the NASDAQ is ripping up higher and what's going on here? Why isn't this moving even further up? Well, look at the advanced decline line on the NASDAQ composite. First off, you see price is, you know, 
basically matching its high right here, okay? But what is the internals telling you? The internals are telling you a completely different story. It's not even next to this peak right here from a cumulative perspective. So either that tells us that we have a lot more of a bounce to come from these low end or these not like mega cap names and these smaller companies that got beat down could potentially bounce. But right now what's shooting us up higher is, you know, far and few between just a couple of names. If you look at the NYSE bullish percent index, this is starting to move up a little bit more, but still not near near that area. And where it gets interesting is when you look at the big dog. So look at the NASDAQ 100. It's much closer to being an overbought condition. As you can see, the RSI is at 67.98. And what I find interesting here is even at that point, if you look at this, this high here on NASDAQ 100 and this high, that right there is a higher high. But what do you see the accumulative line doing on advanced decline? Well, you actually see it's not even matching it yet. Now, this could break tomorrow, but you can see that right there is actually a negative divergence just telling us once again that there's very few names really helping this market out. And you can see here even deeper, the XLK cumulative line. So this is the technology advanced decline line. You can see technology stocks, boom, have been on a monster rip, okay? Just a huge, huge move as the market participants have been really flooding into this. But what do you see the advanced decline line doing? You don't see it matching it. Okay, now take a look here. BPOEX, this is the S&P 100, right? So S&P is S&P 500 at 100. It's a cap-weighted product, and you you know that the top 10 are the big dog names, right? You got uh, Berkshire, you got uh, NVIDIA, you got Meta, you got uh, yeah, all those names, Tesla, et cetera, Apple, Microsoft, Google, blah, 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 blah. Okay, it's much closer to overbought condition here, 66.75 as well. So it's giving us, you know, clarity that hey this move is this move they were probably going to get a little bit more foam above push okay it could be a lot of short coverings as short there was some heavy short market participants and there could have been a covering also into this but it's a time to be very very cautious if you look at the bpspx you can see that it's also because it's cap weighted it's pushing up into that overbought territory as well and then finally to close this off look at the quarterly the quarterly heat map you can see we're year to date heat map right we close on the quarter just some huge monster moves and where are they coming out of very, very few type names, and they're the bigger market cap stocks. So this is a very big kind of dispersion as, as far as, you know, health in the market. This can't last forever. This is the same thing that led to a top in 2022, right, going into 2022, where we saw just cap weight, just like large mega caps push higher and higher, but everything else under the surface was struggling. So these are kind of the warning shots, but as far as price goes, price is looking bullish on the shorter time frame. We're above the five-day moving average. So you got to remain tactical. You got to remain open to the possibilities of things to actually get hit because from a macro standpoint, things aren't looking all too well as well. But as it stands, we're here. Things are bullish, but bullish be a little bit cautious. That's all I got for you, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend.